Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India morning in uh, today's class we will address the orbital requirements of uh, satellites and therefore what a rocket should be doing you know in the last class just to refresh ourselves on what we learned we told ourselves there are something like eight planets revolving around the sun we said these planets consisted of mercury venus earth mars jupiter saturn uranus and neptune we also told ourselves there, is, there was one planet called Pluto which is no longer considered to be a planet because it is not dense. Having said that, you know there is a lot of interest in exploring the different planets and I will take two examples. The first example is one or let us say this is again the repeat of what I just now told you. Maybe you have centrally the sun which is shown in uh, red there, you have about it maybe Mercury after that maybe Venus, then Earth and the different planets. See in between you also see some asteroids which we talked about in the last class. I will precisely come back to this point a little later. But having said that, you know we had a, a launch vehicle known as New Horizon Launch. That means it is a rocket which goes and finds out what is happening in the Kuiper belt beyond Pluto. You know, if you take the time taken to go to Pluto, this was launched in January 2006. It is supposed to reach there in another 4 or 5 years. Something like it takes something like almost 10 years to re reach Pluto. And what does it consist of? It consists of a series of rockets one about the other. And the purpose of this course, at the end of this course, we should be able to size up a rocket. We must be able to put things in a rocket such that we can achieve a specific mission. And that is where I have showed. And the next slide shows maybe something like a spacecraft which this particular rocket launches and it goes round and round the planet what, what we are interested in. Therefore, this goes and looks at the Kuiper belt that is beyond Pluto. The next slide I show here the a launch which took place some 3 days back. It was on August 5, 2011. It was an Atlas Centaur rocket. This again from US. It is supposed to have something known as a Juno mission which is supposed to go and look at Jupiter. You know as per Greek mythology, I think we must have some general understanding. You know Jupiter is supposed to be a god and his wife is known as Juno. Therefore, they have named it as Juno mission. And again, we will have to be able to find a rocket which will meet such missions and that is what this course is all about. Having said that, in the last class, we also looked at the different planets we looked at the mass of the different planets, the diameter, the distance from the sun and so on. One thing we must keep in mind is the earth's mass is around 5.974 into 10 to the power 24 kilograms and its diameter is 12,756. The smallest planet is around Mercury which is one third the diameter of the earth and the largest we said was Jupiter which is quite, quite considerably big planet. right? Having said that, we also talked in terms of moons. We said that the Earth's moon is somewhat smaller than Mercury in size and there are 31 moons which are available in solar system of the Milky Way galaxy. Having said that, we also talked in terms of atmosphere because I asked a question, what is the difference between a, a rocket and an airplane or other vehicles? You all told me uh, rocket is something which flies in vacuum. It is really not vacuum, anything which goes in space is what we call as a rocket and we talked in terms of the temperature variations above the surface of the earth. The y axis here shows the altitude, the temperature is shown on the x axis. We told ourselves because the earth gets heated by the sun, the layer of air above the earth gets heated and therefore, the temperature drops from a high value of around 40 degrees centigrade at the surface of the earth to a low value around minus 60 to 80 degrees centigrade at a height of around around 10 kilometers and at that height, you know that is the height around which an aeroplane flies. Maybe a jet aircraft flies at an altitude between 8 and 10 kilometers. Above this height, again the temperature drops and it drop, it, I am sorry, the temperature increases. That means in the troposphere just above the surface of the earth, the temperature drops 
and after some particular height between 10 and 15 kilometers above that the temperature increases again the increase is because the ozone gas which is available there absorbs the heat energy. But then you keep on going to higher and higher altitude say around 50 kilometers beyond that you know the amount of air available is very small therefore there is nothing really to absorb the heat and therefore the temperature begins to rise again. Whereas when you go to extremely high values around 80, 85 kilometers and so on the individual atoms like oxygen atom combines with oxygen molecule to give out heat and again the temperature increases. But then the pressure monotonically falls and in thermosphere there is hardly any pressure therefore the concept of temperature no longer holds good. It is the individual molecules which are at high temperature or which are moving at high velocity whereas there is no continuum we cannot even talk of temperature it is a fictitious temperature. And therefore when we talk of rockets it goes through the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere into the thermosphere and further is where a rocket flies. I think this must be clear to each one of us. Is there any, any confusion between let us say why the temperature decreases above the surface of the earth? The place where an aircraft flies is around 8 to 10 kilometers where the temperature is around minus 45 to minus 50 degrees centigrade. Then you have the stratosphere, mesosphere where the temperature again increases. Uh, and the, 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 the temperature again decreases in the stratosphere the temperature increases because of ozone, uh, 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 ozone absorbs heat radiation, mesosphere not much gas there in the thermosphere we have no, no continuum and the individual atoms and molecules react to liberate heat and you have something which is not continuum we say molecular region right. Is it clear or is there any question here? You know let us go ahead what else did we do in the last class we, we told ourselves well all planets move in elliptical paths and they trace out equal areas in equal time and but you know if you see the newspapers and the science magazine over the last 2-3 months they keep telling us you know the orbits are elliptical but above the ellipse there are undulations which are there and you see the green color shows the real orbit. But then there is something still more confusing even within the undulations there are further undulations like turbulence which is available. Therefore if somebody is talking of turbulence well even the motion of the planets around the sun looks to be turbulent to me. But anyway anyway you know grossly it is all elliptical path and we have Kepler we talked in terms of Johannes Kepler in the last class. We told ourselves what did Kepler tell well there are three laws one is all planets move in smooth elliptical orbit. The second we said they trace equal areas in equal amount of time. In this figure the sun is at one of the focus and therefore you see the focus on the left hand side around which those white patches show equal areas in equal time. And the third law which was law of harmonics we said that the time period t divided by r namely t to the power 2 t square divided by r cube is the same for all the 8 planets. Therefore you have very very well or synchronized motion of the planets around the sun and therefore this, this is useful or this was useful for, for Newton to be able to formulate the universal law for gravitation. How did we go to it before Newton that means let us go back here we told ourselves Jonas Kepler was in the period 1570 to 1630 afterwards comes Galileo Galilei around the same time little bit later and what did he do he was also interested in looking at the planets you see him on the left hand side gazing at the planets and he is supposed to have done an experiment in which a feather and a steel ball fall together in, in a place which is evacuated or vacuum and he finds that the time taken is the same. And Newton did no experiments he just relied on these observations and what did Newton do well he saw it is stated that he sees an apple falling from a tree. He uses the information which Johannes Kepler gathered namely you have elliptical motion, you have equal areas, you have t square by r cubed is a constant and then he says well and there was this person Robert Hooke you have all read about Hooke's law in, in mechanics stress upon strain and Hooke also was doing the same thing at precisely the same time. And Newton put everything together and he said well an apple gets attracted by the earth because earth is a large mass 
just like the sun attracts the different planets. Therefore, he formulates the universal law for gravity, gravitational forces. Planets fall freely onto the sun, that means planets are freely falling bodies just like a stone falling on the earth. Therefore, what did we tell you in the last class again? We said this states that if I have a heavy mass m1 as shown over here and then I have a light mass m2 which is at a distance r away, then I have the attraction force with which the heavy body attracts the lighter body is given by f is equal to g into m1 m2 by r square. This is the universal law for gravitation. We said g has units of Newton meter square by kilogram square, the unit is 6.670 into 10 to the power minus 11. With this we should be able to do problems, but then we were not clear how this gravity force comes. What is this gravitational field? It comes from more from different areas from physics. We must be able to understand why gravitational field exists. It is still not proven, but you have very powerful minds like Stephen Hawking. We said he was a physicist who is looking into the different mechanisms. We, we had different people looking at the laws, but still not clear. We just told ourselves if I stretch something, if I put a heavy mass, the heavy mass and I put a light mass, the heavy mass maybe pulls down the stretched rubber and therefore the light mass rolls towards it and that is what we say is a field. And we went further, we expanded the value of the universal law g m1 m2 by r square in terms of let us say the heavy mass being the earth, r being the radius of the earth plus the altitude r e plus h and we found that f is equal to minus m g. And but you know the gravitational field is not constant all along the surface of the earth because earth is little bit chubby in shape, it is not a pure sphere and therefore you find that with the angle of inclination or the latitude and the height the gravity or the gra acceleration due to gravity g keeps changing. Therefore, we have f is equal to g m 1 m 2 by r square or in the gravitational field of a particular planet, if g can be expressed in terms of let us say a, a unit, the unit comes out to be meter per second square, which people or all, all of us loosely call as acceleration due to gravity. There cannot be acceleration due to gravity, it is a field, therefore g is the field expressed in meter per second square. This is what we did in the last class, let us progress further. Here I just expanded it out for our information f is equal to g m e that is mass of the earth, radius of the earth r e and h and when we did this we found f is equal to minus m g and we got the value of g as 9.8 meter per second square. This also we derived in the last class. Having said that we have to keep something in mind. We, we define what we called as inertial frame of reference. What did we say all of us are moving, the earth is rotating, all the galaxies are moving sun is also moving, therefore how do we define motion in space? This was a problem for us. Therefore, we said either the object must be stationary or I must be absolutely stationary, then I can see the motion of an object or if I move at constant velocity, then the change in motion of the body is independent of my constant velocity. Therefore, we define inertial frame of reference as a frame of reference which is either stationary or it moves at constant linear velocity. Therefore, based on this linear frame of reference, we talk in terms of Newton's laws of motion which is precisely what we have been talking all along, namely inertia a body continues to remain in a state of rest or of uniform motion unless it is forced otherwise by an external force, makes sense. We say the second law of Newton. We say rate of change of momentum is proportional to force or force is equal to rate of change of momentum, f is equal to d by dt of mv. You expand it out, you take constant mass outside, you have d by dt of v which is acceleration. Therefore, we say the second law of Newton can be expressed either as between force and change of momentum or between mass and acceleration or we say acceleration from second law goes inversely as the mass of the body and directly as the force on a body. We will be using these, these laws and the third law says that action and reaction are equal and opposite. But mind you the important qualification is inertial frame of reference. 
these laws are valid only if the frame of reference is inertial and this is important for all of us. Supposing I want to say I want to find out the temperature distribution in a rotor in a machine. Therefore, I am looking at the blade, the blade is rotating. To be able to find the temperature of a blade, I am I will be sitting on the blade and monitoring the temperature, but I am rotating. That rotating body need not be an inertial frame of reference. Therefore, the momentum equation for a rotating body need not follow the Newton's laws. That means, I will have another equation to describe it and I come, come back to this. Let, let, let me just get, get into this last last slide of what we did in the last class. We told ourselves well to be able to put anything in space you need to give a force. Lucian before the birth of Christ around 40 AD or 40 BC I think what he said is a ship is there on the sea there is a giant storm which pushes the ship into moon he wanted to go to moon. But when we looked at Julia, Jules Verne who, who was a popular science fiction author he said well no well why not have a capsule which is contained in the barrel of a cannon and you push it through. But you know such things are not possible as we shall see a little later. And therefore, the last part which we did in the class was we talked in terms of asteroids which are there which, which are loose bodies which are available in space and one such asteroid missed the space station around 2 months back. Space station is a satellite which is in low earth orbit and it is used for scientific experiments. And you know whenever they see some asteroids they go and correct the position of the space station slightly move it away such that the asteroid does not hit the satellite. And that is where you know you have these misses you know these are all uh, bodies in space which hit each other. But something which was disturbing and which we talked in the last class was you know this I took from the Hindu this was this came in February this year. You know it is said that by April on April 13, 2036 one asteroid the name of the asteroid is Apophis is supposed to hit the earth. And if this asteroid comes and hits the earth well it is reminiscent that the picture on the right side shows an asteroid hitting the earth and the asteroid gets rapidly heated due to friction it explodes and forms a blast wave severe wind and extremely high temperatures that might be the end of civilization itself. And in fact, it is told 6 million years ago the extinction of dinosaurs was because one asteroid came and hit the earth. Therefore, the question is people have been always wondering how to make sure that if an asteroid is going to come and hit the earth, how do I deflect it. Therefore, one of the things which are talked of is well I have something like a like a heavy satellite which I put near to the asteroid and now the asteroid has a certain mass and I, I I because of the force the asteroid slightly shifts away and I can shift it away from the earth and this is known as a space tug. Maybe we will design a space tug in the next class. Having said that I think this is all what we covered and we set the pace to continue further. What did we say in the frame of reference which is inertial I know the equations I know Newton's law. But if I were to consider an orbiting that shows the earth something revolving round the earth as it were. The bottom picture shows the inside satellite going round the earth it keeps on encircling the earth. You find these are all you know that boy there he throws a stone into orbit and it keeps on rotating round and round the earth. Now what is the frame of reference here? The frame of reference may be if I were to consider a bit a particular the pull of gravity attracts it and causes it to fall freely while the forward orbital velocity component shifts it away from, from falling onto the earth and the body gets into a circular orbit. Now for me the frame of reference cannot be supposing I am standing here and looking at it I see it going round and round. I find it difficult to describe that sphere. If I were to sit on the sphere then I know I am here and I see everybody else going in some other motion. Therefore, you know I would like to get back and ask a question can I, can I get out of this inertial frame of reference and describe the motion around a rotating body. Let me put it this way. Let us take an example all of us go to the circuses and you know one of the things which is shown in a circus is you have 
something like like a spherical cage you know a loosely cage a, a motorcyclist gets in and he goes round and round it all of us have seen it right how, how, how does he support himself how what is the principle by which he is on top he does not fall down and if I were to consider myself sitting along with the cyclist and I want to describe my motion and that is how a satellite is there I, I would like I would I would like to know what is what is the type of forces which are acting on me and for this to be able to correctly describe the motion of bodies as they are rotating we say it is a non inertial frame it is not something which is moving at constant velocity or which is stationary but in the frame of reference of something which is darkened there I say well it is rotating and at that I call as x dot I would like to be able to find out the forces or rather describe the motion in the in the frame of reference of a rotating body this is what I will be doing in today's class and along with that we will be able to find out what we mean by orbit therefore let us come back I, I, I cease with the slide show let, let us get back to the lecture therefore what is it I am telling I have something like an orbiting something is orbiting over here maybe I have the center over here let us say a ball is going round and round this is the rotating frame of reference I am interested in finding out the equation of motion with respect to the rotating frame of reference is there something more I have to do my question is as long as I considered myself to be stationary I said inertial frame of reference is that Newton's laws of motion are ok but if or if I move at constant velocity the inertial frame of reference is there what is the change when I use a rotating frame of reference I want us to be very clear because I think I must make make myself absolutely clear on this the perspective is not that I am standing here and we told ourselves when I stand on the earth I assume I am moving at constant velocity then I am in an inertial frame of reference <coughs> I am not looking at the body from the inertial frame of reference but I want to look at the body which I call as coordinate x dot which is a rotational frame of reference in other words I also sit on this body and I now I ask myself can I describe my motion properly let, let me say instead of me standing here and watching this this <coughs> mass go round, I tell myself well I am on this body and I want to describe my motion properly in other words you know that my motion around x I am on this body therefore with respect to the body my motion is dx <coughs> by dt is equal to 0 right there is no no change. <coughs> but how do I describe this motion then let us let us come back let us say that I move with a velocity angular velocity omega and let us say at time t I am at this particular point therefore the omega t is equal to theta <coughs> I start over here at a time duration t I have reached this particular point and therefore I can write this is my x coordinate this is my y coordinate this I call as x dot which I have just written <coughs> excuse me therefore I write now x prime is equal to if the radius of the of the circle around which it is going is capital R I can write x prime is equal to R cos <coughs> omega t this is x over here. y is equal to r sin omega t right that is the x component of the radius is x cos theta and the y component of the radius is y r r sin <coughs> theta and theta is equal to omega t therefore I differentiate it I get dx by dt is equal to minus r omega sin omega t and I get 
dy by dt is equal to r that is r omega into cos omega t. I take I further instead of taking the velocity along x and along y, I want to find the acceleration along x and y, I get d 2 x by d t square is equal to minus again it becomes minus omega square r, omega comes here omega square r cos omega t and the second equation I get is d 2 y by d t square is equal to minus omega square r into sin omega t. In other words when a body is rotating I find I can describe the acceleration along x it is pointed it is minus it is in this direction equal to minus omega square r cos omega t I have acceleration in this direction is equal to ome minus omega square r sin omega t and the net acceleration if I were to write I get the net acceleration a is equal to under root of these two namely <coughs> omega square r whole square into sin square omega t plus cos square omega t which is 1 and therefore this is equal to omega square r is the acceleration. That means when something is rotating I have a net acceleration which is along the radius pointing towards O because this is in this direction, this is in this direction, this is the direction in which it is rotating and therefore I have a net acceleration over here. Now from second law we know that if something is rotating and I have an acceleration, I have for this particular body which is rotating, I have a force in this direction equal to minus m omega square I, I did not take the value because and I, I say that the force is in this direction towards the center this is the body which is rotating and therefore I have a force equal to mass into acceleration is equal to m omega square r. What is the name of this force? Cannot be centrifugal. It is a force which is acting you now my question was what is this force? This force is known as centripetal force. This is all what we can say. We are, we are considering a body which is rotating. I say that there is a net force which acts towards the center and this force is equal to m omega square r. What is this point? I say I am sitting on this body in the perspective of this particular body. My x dot is 0. Therefore, when x dot is 0 dx prime by dt is equal to 0. Therefore, let us go back and write, write the equation here. We therefore know that d2 x bar by d t squared is equal to 0, right. But then you find acceleration of the body in the frame of reference of the body is 0. But then I find yeah, I am talking of a force which is available to me. Therefore, if I have to describe my motion correctly, therefore let me put it, if I have to I have to correctly sort of predict my motion. What should I do? It is necessary for me to put a force on the body equal to minus omega square r to be able to in that case only this will be 0 because I find there is an acceleration which is coming a force in this direction. For me to be stationary I must put a force in this direction and this is what I call it, it cannot be real right. I am putting a force on the body therefore it is something which is virtual or which we call as a pseudo force. And why do I have to put this force? To be able to correctly describe the motion of the body when in the context of the body itself because I am sitting on the body and if I say that I am not moving I, that is only possible when I put a motion like this such that 
the centripetal force and this pseudo force are same and this pseudo force is what we call as centrifugal force. Let me let me just repeat whatever I have said in, in short. All what we are saying is in a, in an inertial frame of reference Newton's laws are valid. Now, I consider a frame of reference which is not which is not an inertial frame, but it is a rotating frame. Now, I am looking at the motion from the perspective of the body which means I am sitting on the body. If I am sitting on the body and I am rotating then in that case to be able to correctly define my, my coordinate or with respect to me if I want to define it is necessary for me to be able to I go wrong I consider this it is necessary for me to put a pseudo force to be able to correctly describe my body because I find that d 2 my position x dot by d t square is equal to 0. In other words I have a centripetal force minus omega square r and I have to put a force equal to plus m omega square r to be able to correctly determine my motion the which we call as a pseudo force it is not a real force, but it helps me to find out the forces in a non inertial frame of reference. See this we will keep on encountering whenever we use these codes you know we use fluent code to determine some, some gas motion or gas mixture. We must be very clear he might have written it for an inertial frame of reference. If I have a body which is sort of going on side which is rotating I could have some other forces therefore, frame of reference is extremely important in any problem what we consider. Therefore, now let, let me let me summarize what I have been telling you so that we go back and start finding out what are the velocities in orbit and what we want to do. All what I have been telling is well I consider a body which is rotating and I tell myself if I am looking at the rotating frame of reference it is necessary for me to put a pseudo force which I call as a centrifugal which I call as centrifugal force equal to m omega square into r where m is the mass of the body. Therefore, let us come back to this problem let us consider earth to be here let us consider a satellite or some body of mass m going around earth as it were. Now, I want to find out the motion of this particular body. Therefore, all what I say is well let it rotate with an angular velocity omega. Then the, the pseudo force is equal to pseudo force which we call as centrifugal force is equal to m omega square r which is acting in this direction. Now, what balances the pseudo force? What, what would be balancing? Let us say this object is going round the earth what will be balancing this pseudo force? Gravity, how would you tell what will you say how, how would we describe it? You are telling me that the gravitational forces balance the pseudo force in other words all what I am saying is pseudo force acts in this direction equal to m omega square r and what is the force in this direction the gravitational force which is given by universal law for gravitation is equal to the mass of the body mass of the earth divided by r square into the gravitational constant. Now, we are saying some body is rotating around this therefore, I take the force balance and what is the force balance I have the pseudo force or centrifugal force m omega square r is equal to g into m mass of the earth divided by the distance from the center of the earth to this particular body r square and now I find out my, my, my angular velocity m and m cancels you find that irrespective of the mass of the body the value of the angular velocity is the same 
and I get is equal to g m e by r cube. And this is what gives us the angular velocity of rotation of a body around anything. If I were to consider instead of the earth, I say I am going round the sun, say I go round the sun and let us write the equation for it. We tell ourselves well I have the sun over here, I have a body going round the sun at a distance r from the center of the sun. This is my body of mass let us say small m, this is the mass of the sun m s, the distance is r. Then for exactly the same thing, I have the gravity force that is f is equal to mass of the sun into g into <coughs> the mass of the body into r square and I have the pseudo force here which is equal to <coughs> excuse me m omega square r right. Therefore, I get the angular velocity as equal to g mass of the planet into distance from the center of the planet. This could be a mission around moon, we have the angular velocity and once I know the angular velocity, I need the velocity of orbit therefore, the orbital velocity, what is the velocity with which it is rotating v 0, v 0 is equal to what r omega. which is equal to I put the value of r here and what is the value I get? r becomes r square inside that means I get r square over here into r cube and therefore I get so many meters per second. This is how we calculate the orbital velocity of any body like moon is going round the earth, you know the mass of the moon, you know the mass of the earth, you know the distance between the center of moon and center of earth, we know the speed at which the moon is travelling which we call as orbital velocity. Let us do a simple example to illustrate this, let us find out the velocity of a body or let us say a spacecraft or something which let us say we say this is the earth as it were, something is rotating round the earth at a height let us say of 100 kilometers above the earth. <coughs> I want to find out the velocity of the orbit v 0. Therefore, how do I, I just make use of this equation, I have v 0 is equal to under root g v said was equal to 6.670, 10 to the power minus 11, what was the unit? Newton meter square by kilogram square into the mass of the earth, the mass of the earth was uh, 5.974 into 10 to the power 24 kg multiplied by kg divided by the r you said 100 kilometers above the surface of the earth therefore r is equal to the radius of the earth is 6380 kilometers plus 100 kilometers which is equal to 6480 kilometers. into 10 to the power 3 meters 1 over meter square 1 over meter this is meter this is under root therefore what am i left with i am left with kilogram kilogram meter newton is equal to kilogram meter per second square Therefore, this becomes under root meter square by second square and the unit is meter per second. So, much meter per second is the orbital velocity and this if you calculate will come out to be about 7.76 into 10 to the power 3 meter per second or 7.76 kilometers per second. This is typically the velocity of a body orbiting the earth 
at a distance of 100 at a height of 100 kilometers. This is how we calculate the orbit velocity. Let us go a little bit further. What do we find from this? We find that as the height above the earth increases, the value of orbital velocity will keep coming down. When I reach infinite height, the orbital velocity is really 0, right. This is, in other words, whenever we are considering any planet, a body orbiting around the planet, I can calculate the velocity v0 in meters per second or the orbital velocity of the rotating body. We talk in terms of insect spacecraft which is going around the earth and therefore we say well it is at this height and therefore it is rotating at this particular speed. Well I think I will I'll stop here in the next class what we do is we will go into some details of maybe see you find that the orbital velocity keeps falling we would like to understand but as the height of the body increases I must give more velocity to the body to reach that height. Therefore, where is I have I, what is the total velocity which is required for a rotating body and then we will go into some more details of different orbits and then fix what are the requirements for a rocket to be able to put some spacecraft in different orbits that is what I want to do. Well, thank you. There.